of light for the transfer of information. You know, the stars on one side of the galaxy have to know where the other ones are to be able to actually spiral. Uh, the solar system, the planets have to know where the sun is right at this instant. If they didn't, if they didn't, uh, if they weren't pulled to where the sun is right at this instant, they would be slung out of the solar system like a slingshot. We know that doesn't happen, but this is never, um, it's not questioned. You know, these, these basic questions are skimmed over. We're not taught them to think about them at school. Uh, by the time you get to university, you've been brainwashed to the point where they don't even appear as a question. And I think this is a failure of our education system. We're not challenging kids to think about these basic, simple ideas and question what the, our forebears have passed down to us. Can I clarify something that I'm not clear about? Is your mm -hmm. basic stance regarding gravity that it shouldn't be the operating force we're thinking about or that it shouldn't be the primary emphasis in science? In cosmology. In, in cosmology. Define cosmology for us, please. Cosmology is really the study of our existence in the universe. Um, and the funny point of it is, of course, that the Big Bang has nothing sensible to say about our existence. It's a kind of haphazard, um, it's completely random kind of... Uh, theory, which you can just add barnacles to it as you go to <laughs> cover new discoveries. And this is what happens, of course. Everything is a surprise when it's discovered, but it's patched onto the, um, the theory. And this is not the way to go about science. Uh, it's better if you can have a, th a model which you can make predictions from, uh, which are then borne out. But Big Bang Theory has never been able to do that. All of its predictions, it, well, it, it stopped making predictions. Does Stephen Hawking believe in the Big Bang? Is he a proponent of the Big Bang Theory? Yes, I think um, all the leading uh, scientists and astrophysicists uh, believe in the Big Bang. And I think that's the key word, they believe, believe. in Believe, okay. Yeah. You call the Big Bang model the Poltemic universe? Am I saying that right? Well, I, I don't think those are my words. Okay. Uh, I think uh, basically it's just a, a story. It's like um, the traditional stories of the uh, Aboriginal nations um, it's just another version where you uh, set up your narrative, which is not to be questioned, otherwise you're excommunicated or dealt with by you know, those who um, look after the story. Um, but it has nothing much more to say about our existence than those old traditional cosmologies. You had also said that radio astronomers are very important to translating and showing evidence for the fact that we live in an electric universe. Explain why. The reason I say that is that um, the work of the Nobel Prize winning plasma physicist Hans Zelfain uh, showed that uh, you can actually trace circuits around the sun and show that there are electric currents flowing within the solar system. You can take that then and look at galaxies, and the same thing applies, that uh, electric currents flow in along into the poles and then out along the spiral. And it's those electric currents which um, are responsible for people trying to find forces or matter that doesn't really exist because they don't take into account the electrical currents. Now, these electrical currents generally uh, in the form of in invisible, what are known as Birkeland currents, which are just like the high-voltage transmission lines we see you know, draped across the countryside. And in the same way that they don't glow in the dark, uh, the Birkeland currents don't glow either. But they can be traced by radio telescopes because they give off radio waves. It's just like the uh, radio noise you get from the hum, the 50-cycle power hum you get from power lines. You can pick it up by the appropriate radio detectors. So initially radio astronomy was thought to be a total waste of time. Astronomers thought, you know, there's, there's nothing worth looking at there um, in space for in uh, radio waves. But it, the reverse has been found, that they've been able to discover things which the um, astronomers using normal telescopes, uh, visible telescopes and X-ray and so on, haven't been able to see. And they can actually trace the circuits, which makes it very important in an electric universe because we, the critical thing in understanding the electric universe is to understand that uh, we are connected electrically. There are electric currents flowing through everything, through the universe. Which brings me to the next question. You know mm -hmm. how when we were all very young, people would say, oh, you're in the ethers. That's an etheric thing. People would make jokes about the ethers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if where you grew up, people did that every now and then, but they did where I live. I live in Los Angeles. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so there was a lot of, oh, you're from the ethers, you know, if you're artistic or creative. But 
Yes. Then other people came around and said, no, really, there is something called the ether. Is there, from your perspective, does something called the ether exist from your cosmology? To. Okay, talk about it. Well, back in the 19th century, it was known that the ether had to exist. In fact, Maxwell's equations for radio waves uh, and light uh, require that you have a medium for a wave to exist. You can't have a wave in nothing. You can't wave nothing. So from that very obvious uh, standpoint, uh, there has to be an ether. But Einstein discarded it without explaining how he could still, um, <laughs> how light could still function. I think we have, uh, we really have to re-examine Einstein's work, and particularly of those who followed him uh, without question, uh, because I think they bequeath us a completely um, Alice in Wonderland universe. So the reason you need an ether is uh, first that it, you cannot have an electric field in empty space. It has to uh, focus on a charged particle or on a particle which in, incorporates cha other charged particles. So the ether has to be made up of matter. And I suggest in the electric universe that that matter is actually these neutrinos. Now, you, I think most people have heard of neutrinos. They're I haven't. To... <laughs> I'm in the vacuum okay. here. <laughs> Well, the Standing in the uh, vacuum. <laughs> Surely I'm in the vacuum listening. Yeah, well, neutrinos are supposed to be the least massive. In fact, for a long time they were thought to have no mass. So uh, they almost don't exist, so to speak, in physics terms. But they were required to make the um, equations work out, you know. Anyway, they were finally discovered and detected, and now they've got neutrino detectors in the... Um, down deep in mines in various parts of the world to detect neutrinos from the sun because the nuclear reactions that occur on the sun produce neutrinos and these neutrinos have no charge so they just whiz through matter as if it's not there. In fact, it was calculated that they could travel through light years of lead shielding without hitting anything to give you some idea of how non-interactive they are. Well, I suggest in the electric universe the neutrinos are actually the ether. They are the substrate. They're the thing that they're the material that waves when you a light wave travels through so-called empty space, or radio waves travel through space. And uh, therefore, light or the speed of light is merely a characteristic of the medium. It's a characteristic of um, the neutrinos. Light travels at different speeds in different media. So that's all it is. Light is a disturbance in a medium. It's, it's as simple as that. It's not a particle. You don't have to invoke particles in the electric universe model uh, because then you run into this crazy situation in physics where one experiment, you talk about light as being a photon or a particle, and another one, it has to be a wave. And you can't have it both ways. What is a photon? A photon is a so-called virtual particle. In other words, it's one invented to try and explain what is observed and that is the transfer of energy from one atom to another at a distance, uh, but only in packets. In other words, it has to be just the right amount. It can't be more or less. It has to be just the right amount. A photon is nothing, or it's just an invented word? I mean, there's biophotonics. There's a whole field. It's an invention uh, based on quantum theory, and quantum theory is a, a virtually a mathematical recipe book with no explanation in physics, in, in reality. So they invent particles where necessary uh, to explain things, but these particles have no real existence. I always thought a photon was a light wave. No. Uh, I think some of us who don't study this receive mm. that as being photon is energy of light or something like that. I don't know what it is. Well, uh, neither do the physicists. <laughs> <laughs> neither do the people who talk confidently about it. <laughs> so do you think a vacuum has matter in it? Yes. If you produce the most perfect vacuum, say you had a, a, a glass jar and you managed to suck every atom of air out of it, okay, there it would still be full of neutrinos because neutrinos can pass through the glass walls of that tube as if it wasn't there. So it's as full of neutrinos as you know the same object next to it uh, in in uh, in the atmosphere. So you cannot uh, create a perfect vacuum. It's always full of neutrinos. And if neutrinos are made up of normal matter, which, you know, they must be to exist, then they are made up of uh, charged particles. 
And when you have charged particles,